I will request everyone to have a seat, please. Those who are standing there, please sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, esteemed faculty members, students, and our guest lecturer, welcome to the selected session, The Tectonic Footprint, Tracking Organic Origins, Collaborative Research in the Himalaya. Presented by Dr. Mary Hubbard from Montana State University. We are honored to have her with us here. I am Zohar Ahmed, your host today. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce our lecturer to you, you guys. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank our Honorable Chairman, Dr. Shubhoto Kumar Sahab sir, for helping us throughout the whole program and suggesting us valuable advices to, to conduct this ceremony today. I would also extend my thanks to our faculty advisor, Dr. Amar Hussain Bhuya sir, for his continuous support towards the program. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to provide some information about Mary. Um, Professor Mary Hubbard is a renowned expert in the field of geoscience and tectonics. Um, she has made some significant contribution to the structural studies of Himalaya and in general geology of the total Himalayan range. Uh, she is also an aspiring scientist and a very good educator. She is also a NATGEO featured scientist who has been related here, who has been contributing to the field of geology since the last decades. Uh, today, Professor Howard will share her insights on tracking orogenic origins, collaborative research in the Himalaya. So, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mary. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, Mary. Uh, you can still hear me. Okay. Well, thank you for having me here. And uh, I just have to say right off, this is the most gorgeous lecture hall I've seen at any university in any country on this planet. <laughs> and, and I'll also say, those seats look so comfortable, now I'm worried you're all going to fall asleep. <laughs> so uh, we'll try to, try to keep this interesting for you. So, um, yes, I, I've been introduced, and, and you see the title here on the slide. So I'm going to just jump right in. Oh, actually, before I jump right in, I'll just say that just a few weeks ago, I was at the conference, yeah. the Geological Society of America conference, and I crashed a party. So I don't know if you use this expression, crashing a party, when you're really not a member of the, and you're not supposed to be at the party, but you crash the party. So I went anyway um, to this gathering that was a Dhaka University uh, alumni evening. And, uh, and so it was really a great pleasure to meet, um, meet a lovely group of people, um, at least one of whom is here in the room. I don't know where he went. Um, uh, so yeah, so that was my first introdu introduction really to your university. Okay, but uh, I, now I want to say a few words about this lecture tour that uh, I'm participating in. And this is sponsored by the Geological Society of America, and it's called the James B. Thompson Distinguished International Lecture Tour or something. But it's, uh, it's a, an award that was named in the honor of James Thompson, a professor from Harvard University, a mineralogist, petrologist. And his family, on his passing, his family put together uh, funds to establish this award. And it covers the cost of two trips um, to give lectures uh, kind of in the countries of, of your choice. But not only do they fund an, an American to go overseas, they also fund somebody from an international location to come to the United States to give talks. And, and so any of you faculty I see sitting in the front who are interested in being nominated for this, uh, you know, you can actually come uh, to the U.S. and give, uh, give lectures through the same program. But so with that, I thank GSA for establishing this award. And we referred to J J James Thompson, Professor Thompson is JBT, his initials. That seems to be how he was known when he was alive, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I thank, I thank him and his family for establishing the award. 
And then within GSA, there's an international division. And uh, it's, it's really through that, and I'll just say that your alum, Naz Kanakar, has been, he's been the past chairperson of this division for, I don't know, six, the last six years or so. He's just turned it over this year to somebody else, but uh, he's been um, quite inspirational, and I have to confess, he's the one that nominated me for the award, so I, I owe him a little bit of thanks as well. Um, we are where we are in our lives, in our careers, due to the support that we have from uh, people in our lives. And so with that, I, I am also thankful to my scientific collaborators, which includes former students, former and current students, mentors that I've had, as well as family, friends, and, and that support network that helps you achieve the things that you do in your life. So I think that's important. Um, so I was fortunate as a graduate student to take classes from uh, Professor Thompson, JDT as we called him. And, and so this award has sort of extra meaning for me because I knew the man and took classes. I could also say I sort of feared the man. This guy was brilliant. He'd been a mathematician before coming into the geosciences. And he had this ability to, to think about mineral composition in, I'll say, four dimensions, maybe even five, and none of them were time. Um, so he would put mineral composition at different ends of, of space. Um, sort of like we see, we just see three dimensions really over here, but uh, he created these spaces uh, and to allow him to understand the mineral systems. I confess, I took, I took his cla two, two classes of his, um, and I took them past fail, and it's a very good thing that I took them past fail. Very difficult classes. But I recently retired, and, and when you retire, and you have an office full of stuff, you have to sort of go through that office and clean things out. And I happen to have a file folder for every class I took as a student, every trip I took as a faculty member. And so when I was cleaning things out, I found the little slips that back in the olden days, we didn't do things electronically. We had pieces of paper, and we had to go to a professor to get permission to take their class. And so uh, Jim Thompson's autograph, his signature, is here on this one when he let me into the class. But I also found in that file folder notes of his that he had passed out in class. This was not a published paper, but just his course notes. And then this was a paper that was written about his work um, by some other scientists. And then, of course, well, that came out of the course notes. So um, I, I will also say that while he was, he was very much uh, what we'd say a coat and tie professor in the classroom, he was very formal in his attire, a white shirt and a necktie and a jacket, uh, but he was also a field geologist. And so in one of those classes, the metamorphic petrology class, he took us, so MIT and Harvard are in Boston, Massachusetts on the East Coast, he took us north to the southern part of the states of Vermont and New Hampshire, where there's some amazing metamorphic rocks. And there he showed us, uh, you know, here are snowball garnets. So these garnets were deformed while they were growing, and they, they have a little S pattern in there, if you can see it, next to the, the coin. And then the, this is a garbage sheafer. These are hornblende minerals uh, exposed there. But he was very good and very excited and very dynamic teaching in the field as well. So uh, moving forward in this presentation, the things that I want to cover, I'll give you a little bit uh, of my own background and, um, and a little bit of information about my plans for this lecture tour as they stand today. And then we'll move into geology and we'll talk about mountain belts, why mountain belts, why international collaboration, and then we'll talk about some of the geology that I've worked on in the Himalaya. So just in terms of my own background, um, my undergraduate days, I started at a small college in, in New England, which is part of the Northeastern United States, but I, I, I transferred to University of Colorado Boulder, so that's where my bachelor's degree was from, as a geology major. In graduate school, I made a similar move. I started at a, a state university in the state of Wyoming, but my advisor was hired by MIT, and I ended up following him uh, to MIT, which was a really fantastic opportunity that came my way. 
I was able to do a postdoc at the ETH Zurich. I worked under a man named John Ramsey, and anybody who studied structural geology I was probably familiar with the name John Ramsey. He recently passed away, but he was quite a legend in the field of structural geology. My professional career then started with uh, assistant professor at the University of Maine, um, uh, associate and full professor and then department head at Kansas State University in the middle of the country. Maine is way up in the northeast corner of the United States. Kansas State's right almost dead center in the middle of the United States. While I was at Kansas State, I had a sabbatical and went to New Zealand and uh, spent a semester at the University of Canterbury. When I left Kansas State, I went to Utah State University, and I went there as the Dean of the College of Science, and then later became a, a Vice Provost over international programs, so our study abroad uh, programs and our, um, our recruitment of international students and so on. I then moved northward to Montana, where I reside today, and there I was a department head for a little while and then back on the faculty. And then I, during the time at Montana State, I've had two Fulbright opportunities. Fulbright as a fellowship program through the United States government. And, uh, and I was able to spend uh, the first one six weeks at uh, Tribubon University and the second one five months at Tribubon University. The five months was just in 2022, so fairly recently. So my research interests are understanding the deformation of our Earth's crust. And I've had the opportunity to work really at multiple crustal levels. I started in metamorphic rocks and sort of mid-crustal levels in the Himalaya. Uh, New Zealand, the work was in brittle structures um, uh, and, and, uh, and the geomorphic expression of faults, so really at the upper crust part of, uh, of our Earth. I also have an interest in the topography that's related to the deformation and, and to mountain building. And I think the two are very interrelated, and we'll, we'll talk about that in this presentation. And then I've, I've done a little bit of work in climate. In 2019, the National Geographic Society sponsored an expedition that I was able to participate in with my graduate student. And there we were coring lakes uh, and looking at the, the climate record over the last 2,000 years or so from the lake cores. But the, the work that National Geographic sponsored included a much broader, it was like 40 scientists, so we were just a small piece of that. Okay, this is my favorite map. Um, I show this in my class often. It's my favorite map for several reasons. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons is that it very nicely shows um, where the areas of high topography are, where the mountain belts are around the world. It doesn't really do justice to Antarctica, that's a little bit distorted here, but if we ignore that for now and look at the rest of the continents, uh, we really can see where are the areas of high topography, and, and, and that's all areas of, of active or fairly recent crustal deformation. I also like this map because it doesn't have political borders on it. <laughs> uh, political borders just seem to muck everything up, and, and uh, anyway, it's, it's really a, a pretty amazing planet if, if we can just uh, look at it in its pure form. Uh, so the red dots, of course, on that were places that I worked in my career uh, around the world and been able to take students. But moving on to the lecture tour. Oh, the lecture tour is okay. <laughs> uh, for the fall, um, so just right now, this is the trip that I am on at the moment. And of course, there you see Dakai University. So, so Bangladesh is my first stop on this tour. Though I, I flew through Nepal, I had six days in Nepal. I haven't given any lectures yet. Yesterday was my first, uh, and here we are at Dakai University. I will also, on this trip, later on this trip, um, give lectures at the Trichandra campus and the Pokhara campus. They're having holidays now. The Nepalis like holidays, and, um, and so uh, a good part of the autumn season is in holidays. So, uh, I have to wait for those to subside in Nepal. Um, in the spring, uh, I'll, I'll go to a variety of other places. So this will be in March. I'll start in Japan at Kyoto University, where there's some scientists who worked in the Himalaya in their career. I have a connection in Indonesia out on the, the very e easternmost part, um, on the, the western side of the island of Timor. So I'll visit that university and then um, travel to India. And so right now, I'm, I'm still working on the logistics, but I'll be at several universities in India, uh, one university in Bhutan, 
and I'll go back to Nepal again um, to some of the other campuses that I haven't visited. Okay, so moving to mountain belts. Why, why do we study mountain belts? Well, mountain belts are clearly places where we can observe and study uh, the effects of crustal deformation. So mountain belts um, bring rocks that have been buried very deeply up to the Earth's surface, so we can look at those deeper crustal processes, but of course we can also look at the active crustal processes at the Earth's surface. Um, yeah, the topography and the relief that we see in mountain belts, it allows us to also study the erosional processes, and the feedback between erosion and tectonics I think is quite complicated. Um, you all here in Bangladesh, you're the recipient of both those processes and that all that sediment that's uh, eroded out of the Himalaya and even off of Tibet comes down through the great river systems and, and, uh, and it's been doing this for a long time. So my understanding is that just offshore in the Bay of Bengal, you have up to 20 kilometers of sediment that has come off those mountain belts and that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, lots of people live in the mountains. And so these people uh, both depend on the natural resources that are there, but they also uh, have to deal with the impacts of the natural hazards that come with steep mountain terrain. So earthquakes, Nepal just had an earthquake in the western part uh, just last week. I was there, I mean, I was in Kathmandu, I was asleep, I didn't actually feel it, it was far enough away. But some people, the people that were awake, did feel it in Kathmandu. Uh, but sadly, the construction in that area was not very good, and so many lives were lost. So just as an example, but flooding, of course, you all are well aware of flooding, but the, those mountain valleys are subjected to some massive floods as well for a variety of reasons. And then uh, mountain belts also impact both weather and climate, I'll say. So uh, on the shorter term, uh, having a mountain belt is going to impact uh, the local weather that you get. But over a longer term, something like the Tibetan Plateau, that's such a large, so large an area, has really affected the, the uh, high altitude wind patterns, the jet stream, and so on. So there's obviously an impact of, of mountains, mountains on climate. Okay, well, why international collaboration? So when I began to try and figure out how I was going to express the importance of international collaboration, I did a little search on our library's webpage, um, and it turns out there's a whole group of people who spend time studying international collaboration and basically the benefits of it. So this quote here um, comes from one of those papers. Well, uh, the best science, I mean, how do we define the best science? That's a more difficult question, I'd say. Um, but I think, I think the more important thing is that when we, when we come together to work on a problem, but several of us come together from different backgrounds, with different perspectives, different past experience, different education, we see problems in a different way, but we also see solutions in a different way. And by having those multiple perspectives, we're much better equipped to solve the problems that we set out to, to work on. Um, in terms of you know, how people measure best science, well, you know, sometimes it's done with how, many, how often or how many times a paper has been cited. I don't know that that's always the best way, but again, this group of researchers who have been trying to quantify you know, the, the best science um, have, have come up with this you know, they, they documented that the papers that are the most highly cited have authors from multiple countries or multiple backgrounds. So, um, so I think that's important. Um, international collaboration can have the can have the potential anyway to create some balance. And when I say that, again, my experience, a lot of my experience is in Nepal. Um, there are there is almost no analytical capability to speak of in the geosciences in Nepal. And so uh, they, they rely on working with people from other countries that have that international expertise. And, um, and so you know, the hope is that people from other places who have those analytical labs can help train Nepalis. And ultimately, you know, ideally, Nepal will be able to purchase some of the equipment necessary to date rocks or get chemical composition or, or other sorts of things. 
and I guess also important, it's it's fun to work with people from around the world. So um, so I, I put that there with a happy face. Um, I'll give a little example of just that different perspective sort of thing. So one of the scientists I've been working with recently is Dr. Ananta Prasad Gajarel. He's a Nepali. He teaches at the Tree Chandra campus of Tribhuvan University. He uh, was former department head for probably six or more years. But he and I went uh, up into the high Himalaya to look at some fault zones, which I'll talk about um, soon. And those fault zones are expressed in the in the bedrock, in the in the gneisses and schists and things that are up in the high mountains. So we were up uh, in a village, passing through a village called Namche Bazaar, uh, which you'll also see on a map coming up. And uh, and we're headed up to go look at these rocks. And the Nantes stops at what I view as a pile of dirt, you know, just soil. And and I. I'm like, Ananta, what, you know, what are you doing? And he begins to scratch away at this uh, bit of dirt with, I don't know, his rock hammer or his walking stick or something. And, and what he finds is that there's finely laminated sediment. And he recognizes this as lake sediment. Well, at the time, we're up, this village of Namche is up high above the modern river systems. Um, there's nowhere, there's no basin for a lake to form. And, and I'll tell you that I still don't know exactly why those lake deposits are there. They're just perched on this on the steep hill slope. Um, but this discovery of his led us to, um, in that uh, expedition with National Geographic, we were able to talk them into uh, helping us understand why we had lakes in this area. And so with uh, we had about seven Nepali students with us. But we were able to collect samples for OSL dating. And we now have ages on these deposits. So we know that they, the youngest is uh, about 13,000 years, the oldest about 40,000 years. So we know their ages. And they're, they, this map is, is really hard to see, so don't, don't worry about making anything out. But they come from you know, an area, uh, sort of a broad area. Once we found these, we, we found multiple of these deposits. Uh, but, but the result was that there's now a paper uh, my my PhD student Vivek Giri of Nepali is the first author on this, so it was su submitted during this year. So just an example of uh, an international collaboration. This wouldn't have happened without Ananta and I working together. I wouldn't have been dragging him up the mountain to go look at hard rocks, and he wouldn't have made me stop to look at dirt. Uh, and so uh, so there you have it. Okay. Um, to go back to tectonics and mountain belts, uh, this is a cartoon um, that I just stole from the internet, and the internet stole it from a textbook. But you've all seen um, cartoons like this talking about continental collision. And, and I'll say that um, many of our uh, mountain belts, impressive mountain belts today on the planet, are either the result of uh, continental collision or at least um, convergence of plates, so the subduction process like the Andes. But we're going to talk about the Himalaya and hence uh, taking a look at continental collision. Well, we'll move now to, to the local neighborhood and take a look at the Himalaya. And this is a slide that I, I use when I give presentations in the United States. And I'll just say sadly in the United States, a lot of people um, don't know where Nepal is, let alone Bangladesh. And so it's also helpful to have these maps side by side. I much prefer, this is just a Google Earth image, uh, or composite image over here. Uh, so, you know, there we see our beautiful Arcuit um, Himalayan range, and again, no political boundaries on there. So we know that this impressive mountain belt, the Himalaya, was formed from the collision of the Indian subcontinent with Eurasia, I like to say between 50 and 60 million years. Um, that age is, is difficult to pin down, because one, it's hard to define collision. When, when, do you, when do you call collision collision? Is it when the ocean has closed, or is it earlier than that? Um, so we won't worry about that. We'll just say 50 to 60 million years from now. And so that the result, of course, is again, you know, the the mountain belt. I'm going to be focusing on the Nepal Himalaya, so you know, kind of right here in the almost in the center. So when we talk about inland geology, and some of you are probably very familiar with this, um, we we 
typically presents a map like this. And <clears throat> this map is um, from, from a paper by Yanni Nyman, who has done some work in the Bay of Bengal. She's, she's been working on the cores that have come uh, out of the Bay of Bengal, among other things. But this map was originally put forward in a paper by Augusto Ganser, 1981. And, and we all, all of us, tend to use it just because it shows kind of the whole mountain range. But what I want to point out in this map is that there are um, these sub-parallel uh, lithotectonic units. So that's what the different colors show. So the sub-Himalaya and the darker gray, the lesser Himalaya, the lighter gray, what we call the greater Himalaya. And then we get into Tibet, and these are sediments, unmetamorphosed sediments in the Tethys Himalaya. Um, going from the sub-Himalaya to the greater Himalaya, the metamorphic grade increases in each one of those tectonic, lithotectonic units. The greater Himalayan rocks, or the highest grade metamorphic rocks, also have leucogranitic intrusions in them. But these lithotectonic units are separated from each other by major thrust faults. And so I, I like to present that in more of a cartoon, like this little block diagram, where <clears throat> I have changed the color scheme here, but um, the sub Himalaya, lesser Himalaya, greater Himalaya, but you can see in this the faults that separate them. So they are thrust faults, the main frontal thrust, main boundary thrust, main central thrust. At the very crest of the range, we now recognize that the fault that separates the metamorphic rocks from the overlying sedimentary rocks is an extensional fault, it's a normal fault. And there's still a lot of work being done on that today uh, to help us understand why we have this extensional fault in this convergent mountain belt. And with that, um, oh, I'll just say again a few more words about Augusto Gonser because we owe him quite a lot in our understanding of these lithotectonic belts. He started his work in the 1930s in the Himalaya, mostly in the Indian Himalaya, just west of the border with Nepal, the western border with Nepal. He also snuck into Tibet back at that time. He was a young man, and when, when he went into Tibet, it was illegal to go into Tibet for him to go into Tibet. Uh, so he dressed as a lama, a Tibetan lama. And when he came back out, he had samples with him and he tied them um, into the belly, the long fur and the belly of goats, and uh, came across back across into India like a goat herder. So, um, oh, and he put he smudged something dark on his face uh, to, to look not not quite so white. Um, but he traveled back to the Himalaya many times. So this other photo is in his older years when his hair was quite white, um, but you see all the, uh, those are probably Nepali kids uh, surrounding him. And this is just an excerpt from one of his maps, but that's where he was beginning to recognize the lateral continuity of these different lithotectonic belts. So we'll take a, a tour, and we're gonna start down on the Ganges Plain, um, <clears throat> very flat, uh, yeah, what can I say? It's, it's uh, flood deposits from the Gan in this area of the Great Ganges River. This is in central Nepal. And as we move up into the sub Himalaya, we begin to get uh, some relief, some topography, and actually quite steep sided hills. And the rocks within these hills are molassic deposits, so they're coarse grained sediment that's barely lithified. And so when the mountain range first started to rise and sediment was shed off to the south, that coarse grained sediment is what's now incorporated in these hills. So the, the mountain range has been growing to the south um, with continued convergence. And so now those old molasses deposits are deformed, uplifted, and so we see them here. Um, moving a little bit further north into the Lesser Himalaya, we get higher hills. And you'll notice that they're heavily vegetated and also um, tilled for agriculture. Uh, exposure of rock is a bit of a challenge in the Lesser Himalaya, uh, so you kind of rely on road cuts and, and other steep faces, um, sometimes along the edges of, of rivers. And this photograph here on the left was taken probably off the airplane window when I was flying into Kathmandu. So you can see the greater Himalaya in the background, but all the hills in the front are, are part of that Lesser Himalaya. Um, and so we'll just look at this uh, map on the left is another Google Earth image. And the Lesser Himalayan hills are all these hills in the middle area in kind of a green color. But as we move northward, um, before we get to the white high peaks of, in white, which is snow, 
the, there's a brown color, and that brown color largely traces the main central thrust, which separates the greater Himalaya or higher Himalaya, uh, those higher grade metamorphic rocks, from the lower grade sort of greenish facies rocks of the lesser Himalaya. This, I put this picture in here. Uh, this is a little airstrip. You can see the little airport um, in a village called Lukla. And all the tourist traffic and the mount, mountaineering traffic that goes into climb Everest in Nepal, on the Nepal side, they all fly into Lukla these days. Um, Lukla also sits on a landslide deposit. So this whole thing is a landslide deposit about 40,000 years old. Uh, that came from the opposite side of the valley, down across the valley, would have made an impressive dam. There would have been a big flood when, when the river cut back through that landslide. But Lukla sits there, um, and the sort of importance of that location, from a geologist's point of view, is that that's really on the top edge of the uh, main central thrust zone. So the hills to the north, you can see the topography goes up quite steeply, uh, and we're going into the snowy, high peaks of the Himalaya northward from Lutla, southward we're in those lesser Himalayan hills. But just a little closer look, my work started in Nepal in the 1980s for my PhD field work. And so at that time, I actually didn't fly into Lutla. I flew out of Lutla a couple of times, but I would walk to Lutla. From the end of the road, it was a five-day walk to get into this area. And the first time I came to Lukla, I came, uh, I had been up on the ridge above and I came down into Lukla and I saw this grassy area that I thought was a, a, a football field. Um, it was flat and it was grassy and, and it turns out it's actually not that flat, it goes quite downhill. But it was the airstrip at the time. So this is Lukla in 1985. This was our camping site. You'll see not all the planes were so successful. And even today, if you Google the most dangerous airport in the world, Lukla pops up and there's some amazing YouTube videos that, um, that I don't show my mother. Um, so today, uh, today there have been some changes. They've paved that runway. I, I would be willing to bet that aircraft is the same aircraft at the end of the runway from the 1980s. But, uh, but nevertheless, they did pave, pave the airstrip. Uh, so moving northward into that greater Himalaya, that's where we get up into these high, snowy peaks. Um, doing geology in this area poses its own challenges, so outcrop, there is outcrop, but it's often on these vertical faces, or it's covered by moraine or glaciers in the valley. Um, this is a peak called Chowayu, sits on the border with Tibet uh, or China. Uh, that's my student Vivek Giri in the, in the foreground for scale. This is another photo here, we're looking, uh, this one we're looking northward, this one we're looking a little bit northeast, that is Everest there, peeking up behind a ridge that includes the peak of Lhotse and Nupsi, and then this is called Amadablam here. But yeah, we get up, the topography is really different, the landscape's quite different when you get into those high-grade metamorphic rocks. Here's a close-up of, a closer-up view of Everest. Um, this is actually a scanned image from my slides in the 1980s, but uh, I like it because it nicely shows the, I think you can see the rock fabric of the rock and it's dipping northward into Tibet, so we're looking eastward in this image. And these rocks on the top of Everest are actually sedimentary rocks. There's limestones and slates um, that, are, uh, that are fossil bearing, about Ordovician in age, I think. And so the, the South Tibetan detachment comes right through the top of Everest there and, and, and dips down into uh, the Tibetan plateau. So research that's done in the Himalaya can address many different aspects. There are many, many things we need to know to put together the, the puzzle of, of how this mountain range formed, uh, when these different processes occurred. So people ask, uh, and this is kind of on the tectonic side, but like I mentioned before, when did that collision occur or, and what is that collision? How fast are the mountains going up? Which also means how fast is material, you need to know how fast material is being eroded off. Um, and how much sediment has come off? And this has been a popular question lately, and people come to Bangladesh for the answer, or the Bay of Bengal to look at the sediment that's been shed um, from that rising mountain belt. Uh, people are looking at those major thrust faults, how much displacements have occurred on those faults, and actually we've learned that uh, it's not as simple as those cartoons in that simple map that I showed earlier. There are faults between the big, major big thrust faults, um, uh, so it's a little more complicated. 
And, and then there are faults that um, I'm going to talk about that cut across the range. And so I, I won't address the, uh, all these top questions, but we will look at, at some of these cross faults. Uh, so let's see, just coming back to this map, um, we're going to look at an area for starters that's, uh, that, that's east of Kathmandu. Um, uh, and it's, we're going to look at a fault that cuts across the range as opposed to being parallel to the range. But in, uh, in, so I told you that I had worked in the Himalaya in the 1980s. I had a long gap where I didn't work there. I worked in other places around the world. But in 2016, I came back to this area, went back up into the Everest region, collected some samples um, uh, you know, across this area. There were things that, I had, that had puzzled me that I was curious about from the work I'd done in the 1980s, questions I didn't have answers to. So I collected these samples. When I got back to the US and I was trying to sort of place those sample locations on closer up Google Earth images, so remember, we didn't have Google Earth in the 1980s. We didn't have a lot of things, no email, no anyway, lots of things, but we didn't have Google Earth. Um, and so when I was looking, my sample was from this area down in here, but when I pulled this image up, and this image comes from this red square, I saw these linear features cutting across here. And I've worked in uh, areas like um, New Zealand and like the Western US where we have active faults that leave a topographic uh, break on the Earth's surface. And that's what this looked like. So I was curious if there, was, if there were faults up here. And of course, they somewhat align with the river, the modern river coming down. So in 2017, I went back to this area with a graduate student, with a master's student, to first address the question, is this a fault uh, or a fault zone? And if so, what is it? How did it move? When did it move? What are the characteristics of this zone? So I'll say there's a little village right in here called Bankar. So we call this fault the Bankar Fault. Um, so spoiler alert, um, yes, it's, it is a fault. But so we'll go and, and, and find that out for ourselves. The next slide will have a photograph taken from uh, just near the village of Bankar, looking right up this little gully to something we call the, there's a little saddle in here we call the Bankar Notch. And then it's going to show some uh, a high peak in the background. So. So here we are, this photo on the left, the village of Bankar is right down here in the river valley. We're looking northward or slightly northeastward um, up to the Bankar Notch. And we went up to this area, and what we find were fractures in the rock. It's a gneissic rock, a sort of quartzofelspathic gneiss. But these fractures cut the older north-dipping fabric. So there's an east-west striking north-dipping fabric related to the main central thrust deformation and some of the early Himalayan deformation. These fractures cut that almost perpendicular um, and are steep, steeply dipping, kind of near vertical in some places anyway. Uh, the peak in the background here is the peak of Tabache, and the smaller one is Cholatse. And so a few days later, as we got traveled up the valley and went up closer, we could look again at Tabache and Cholatse. And there, could fairly easily see a nice shear zone cutting down uh, through that face, that south face of, the, of those peaks. And I don't know how well you can see, depending on where you are in the classroom here, but there's a little bit of um, apparent drag on that shear zone that shows the right hand side down, so normal sense move, apparent normal sense movement on this structure. On the left side, or the west side of this little shear zone, is a, is a loop of granite intrusion in here. And these uh, granitic intrusions are about 20 million years old. And so it would appear that probably this shear zone is actually um, shearing around the granite and not cutting the granite itself. Well, when we looked at the rocks uh, up in, in that area, not, not exactly on that face, but um, kind of on the way up to that region, we found uh, beautiful deformation lineations. So in some cases, mineral stretching lineations, mineral alignment lineations, some cases, slick in sides. And they were generally south plunging, uh, sometimes southwest, sometimes southeast, depending on, on the face that they were on. And they typically had uh, a normal right lateral sense of shear. 
and the deformation seemed to be often concentrated along sillimanite rich plains. So the slip was happening on the sillimanite rich plain um, with the quartz in between, um, undisturbed in a way. It didn't appear to be deformed. Um, I did notice in the last two days that, that your buses here in Dhaka also have deformation lineations, very strong deformation lineations. Now, some of them are right lateral and some are left lateral, but it kind of depends which side of the bus you're on, I think. Um, so yes, so look for those lineations. They're very important when understanding deformation. Okay. Uh, so this master student that worked with me, his name was Neil Seifert, and, um, and he mapped, so Bankar, let's see, Bankar is just right here in the southern, kind of the southern edge of this map. There's Lukla, where the airstrip was. Here's Namche, where those lake sediments were. And the summit of Mount Everest is up here on the northern corner of this map. But the two purple lines outline the areas in which he found uh, this steeply dipping, uh, kind of southeast dipping uh, deformation fabric with the normal right lateral sense of deformation. So the deformation wasn't penetrative, meaning that you did not, every rock you picked up didn't show evidence for the deformation, but there were these discrete shear zones uh, across a, a broader zone. And it, it's about three kilometers wide here and close to 10 or 11 up to the north. This area in the north is where those leucogrinitic intrusions are. And I think the zone widens because the shearing has gone around the somewhat maybe more resistant granitic intrusions. Um, so yeah, we did do some really preliminary dating across here, and, and this was Argon 4039 dating, and the best we could do there was to tell that the deformation is younger than 12 million years, which actually doesn't help constrain it uh, too well. I think it's probably at the young end of this, uh, so there's plenty more work to do for sure. Um, also in this area, there um, are very strong dip slopes, and this, is, uh, this has important relevance for landslides. A dip slope in geology is, is a place you probably don't want to build your house because uh, the rocks are going to be weak on that planar fabric uh, and prone to slipping. And so this next photograph is taken, we're looking to the south here um, in the photograph. So behind the people in the background, that hill slope is all a big dip slope um, of that deformation fabric with those sylvanite rich plains. And I think historically, there have been a number of landslides that have come down that probably dammed the river, probably caused some big floods. Uh, so, so there's relevance there. So what are cross faults? Why are they important? Well, I, I sort of, uh, I guess, defined them a little bit, but they, they're faults that, that cross a mountain belt at a high angle to the mountain, the trend of the mountain belt itself. And it turns out, and, and Bebeck, for his dissertation, did some looking at other mountain belts around the world, and sure enough, the Appalachians, the Andes, the Zagros, the Alps, they all have cross faults that, that cross, uh, uh, cross the mountain belt. Now, the displacement's probably not the same in magnitude, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. Um, and so one of, the, one of the ways that they may be important, and we're still working on this, but in 2015, Nepal had some very big earthquakes, and um, this map is a map of, of aftershocks for a period of time after the main, uh, main shocks. So the main shocks are shown in black here. Uh, but these aftershocks are they're largely at kind of 10 to 20 kilometers depth. So the color, the color of the dot corresponds to the depth. Uh, and the interesting thing about this map, and this was recognized by the geophysicists that put the put the map together and really looked at this data to begin with, but they noticed that on the eastern edge, um, the, the aftershocks just end very abruptly along a, quite a linear trace. And um, the, that trace is actually in three dimensions. It's an inclined plane, and when it comes up from the 10 to 20 kilometers to the Earth's surface, it corresponds to something that's been recognized for many years as the Gori Shankar lineament. And even before, well, maybe in the earliest satellite images, uh, people began to recognize this linear feature that cut across the mountain belt, gave it that name. Um, but as far as I know, nobody's gone, nobody's gone to look at the, that lineament to see whether or not it's a fault. Uh, but it could correspond to 
a structure that has limited the propagation of a big earthquake or two big earthquakes. And the important thing with this, one of the important things with this, is that rupture area uh, scales with earthquake magnitude. The larger the area that ruptures, the larger the magnitude of that earthquake. So if there are features in the Earth's crust, in the Himalaya or other mountain belts, that are limiting the propagation of that earthquake rupture, that's keeping the earthquake size a little bit smaller. And geophysicists, again, have recognized uh, the fact that the big earthquakes in the Himalaya are, uh, have been limited to, to certain areas over time. So we have data going back. I mean, people are going back through historical records looking at really early earthquakes, but they're in a, a part of eastern Nepal or a part of western Nepal or a part of the Indian Himalaya. And, um, and so, you know, something's not, not letting those big thrust faults all rupture continuously across the whole range. We don't get an earthquake or earthquakes that, are, that hit the whole range at the same time. So the seg segmentation is what it's called of, of earthquake occurrence. Um, you know, perhaps what's keeping that segmentation there are cross faults. Uh, so work, work to be done. The other important thing I think about cross faults, and I alluded to this with the dip slope uh, comment, but the major river systems in the Himalaya run north-south, roughly north-south, and these cross faults, of course, are running roughly north-south and perpendicular to the trend of the range. And so what that means is that the valley walls on those river valleys are going to be broken fault rock, it's going to be weaker rock, and it's going to make those valley walls more prone to landslides. So this is, a, this is the Malamshi River Valley, it's just east of Kathmandu, but here's one of the many landslides in that valley, when we'll come back to the Malamshi Valley uh, a little bit later. Um, so again, I think, you know, to understand this landslide risk, and that natural hazard, we need to know where these fault zones are uh, and, and maybe when they've moved and what the nature of the rock is um, in the fault zones themselves. So um, we're now going to kind of move to the field and we'll, we'll quickly look at several of these cross faults. Um, the Bengar faults, the one that I've talked about already, and this area up in the northern part of the, in the high Himalaya here, that's what we've looked at. Uh, Bibek Giri, who I've mentioned several times, his dissertation was to look at the Lesser Himalaya and see if that structure continued to the south. I had a master's student on the Gauri Shankar, um, we'll look at his work, and last fall I was in the <coughs> northern part of this fault called the Kosi Fault, um, and then we'll look at a, two little segments around Kathmandu. So going first to the Benkar Fault, here's Bebek. Um, the, the two purple lines here are the purple lines we've seen in that previous map outlining the shear zone up in the high Himalaya. And what he found moving to the south, and he's just uh, superimposed these red lines on an older existing map, so you don't see them offsetting anything, but uh, the red lines are where he found shear zones that were these northeast trending faults. So we're pretty sure that that Benkar Fault system comes down to the south, he didn't have time to take it down to cross the main boundary thrust or the uh, the main frontal thrust to the south, but um, so that's work that you know can yet be done. Looking at those faults in the field or some of those segments, here's one of the one of the segments, and in this particular outcrop, we're looking northeastward. The rocks on the left side, of the western side, are, are all shattered. So this is a deformation zone. And in the core of that fault zone, or that fault structure, it's gouged. So those rocks have just been pulverized uh, in this area. This particular one is dipping a little bit to the northwest rather than the southeast, but it's part of that same system. Um, nearby, a little bit to the south of that last exposure, there's a very sharp contact of faulting that's juxtaposing quartzite, and the layering in the quartzite um, runs obliquely to that fault contact, which separates it from a granitic gneiss that's on the left-hand side of this image. So those are just a couple of field photos. I have a, a Nepali master's student, uh, Nishal uh, Baral, and he worked on the, in two areas on the lineament, the Gauri Shankar lineament. His work was a, it was a little more challenging, and as a master's student, he had a lot less time to follow the structure. But in the north, 
there's a very prominent, so we're looking northeastward, a uh, very prominent, uh, steeply dipping fracture in the rocks. Um, it was hard to find a lot of offset on that fracture, but clearly the rocks uh, had been broken up in that orientation. Down to the south, um, what he found was fault fabric, and there were some mappable units. This was a graphitic schist that he could find some offsets uh, in that graphitic schist that we also think would be related to the Goy Shankar structure. So then I had an opportunity last year when I was in Nepal on a Fulbright um, to go up in, uh, in the area around Ka the peak called Kachanjunga. So Kachanjunga is a high massif of a peak um, just here right on the border with Sikkim. And the Kosi Fault was named by uh, uh, an Indian geologist, Molay Mukul. Some of you may know him. He's at IIT uh, Bombay in Mumbai. And um, he had published and, and uh, speculated that this fault was here, partly based on the big offset um, of, the, of the range front. So he's had an interest in these um, recesses, uh, what does he call them? Recesses, basically these embayments in the mountain front. And what he found in Sakim was that where you have embayments like that, you have a cross fault. And so he speculated that the Kosi was there. Um, so he and I have, have met several times and talked about this. And last year I went up into this area in the red box, which we see up close here. And I think you can kind of see some of the topographic features um, leading in. The yellow dotted line is just our trekking route that we went uh, to try to cross this structure in several places. Um, I don't know that I was quite ready for the trekking in this area. It was very rugged country, the, much more so than the Everest region. Uh, but just a couple of, of things of uh, what we found. Um, in this area up here where the star is, number two, kind of in the higher hills, the, again, there was this dominant, steeply dipping fracture uh, with a northeast trend. And um, uh, off to the east a little bit, but in the Gunsa River Valley, we see these same kind of slick and sided um, or mineral stretching lineation faces um, uh, documenting some of that deformation. These are just a couple of field photos, kind of showing the, the ruggedness of the country. The peak of Kachanjunga would be just off this photo or out, uh, kind of hidden there. Um, but the trail that goes up there, I mean, sometimes it's practically in the river. Uh, other times it's just crossing steep slopes. And in a number of places, those slopes have uh, been affected by landslides. And the trail is quite dangerous crossing. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the area around Kathmandu, there are two places that I visited uh, with Nepali students. So one was south of Kathmandu in the Kulakani area. And while you don't really see the rock fabric in this photo, but behind the waterfall is where there's again this northeast steeply dipping fabric. And the students are working on tracing this uh, to places where they can better access it without getting wet. Uh, but northward and kind of on strike in the Malachi River is a place where there's also some fault fabric. Again, it's a little hard to see in this photo. This photo is just taken with an iPhone looking uh, straight down off of a, a pedestrian suspension bridge. So you can see some cables of the bridge and the fault fabrics down here. And then we're kind of looking, the top part is looking up the valley. But this valley is important um, uh, because in 2021 there was a major flood there. And uh, this is the village of Malamshi Gaon, the small high mountain Malamshi. Um, further downstream, about five hours by car on a very rough road, is Malamshi Bazaar. And what happened in this region, we're looking to the north in this photo, up in the high snowy mountains that we don't see here, there was a cloudburst, a, a storm, brought a lot of water. Um, possibly the, uh, the glacial lake breached um, somewhat, but caused a flood that came down the river valley here. It undercut the hill slope here, which then formed this landslide just below the village. This landslide went down, dammed the river, um, then the river broke through that dam, and that created this massive flood down the Malamshi River Valley. Uh, lots of um, damage and destruction. This is a, an apartment building now sitting in the middle here, uh, basically stripped of, of, of walls and roof and, and everything. So uh, quite a tragic flood in the area. And that photo that we looked at the fabric off the suspension bridge was just down 
in the valley kind of below right here. Um, so what are the possible causes of, of crossfalls? Why would we have these in the Himalaya? There are a number of reasons. Um, the first I'll, I'll talk about is, um, kind of comes out of an original paper by Molnar and Chen in 1981, where they started to do some geodetic work uh, looking at, at the direction or the orientation of convergence along the mountain range and found that convergence direction seemed to be perpendicular to the mountain front or the major thrust faults. Well, that makes it a radial spreading, and that radial spreading would sort of um, necessitate that there was some sort of extension in the range itself. So possibly these cross faults are an expression of that extension. Uh, uh, another possibility, this, this map isn't showing up super well, but this is from a paper by Gaudin and Harris. And they've talked about some of the basement ridges that exist out in the uh, Indian foreland, but they're older structures, much older, in the Indian basement. But the, the strike of those ridges is parallel to where the cross faults seem to be occurring. So it's possible that, uh, that as the subduction continues, the continental subduction, that the, the Indian continent, the topography of that with those ridges, is affecting the overriding um, overriding plate or overriding rock uh, and creating these faults. The problem with that is that the plate motion vector would have to really be parallel to the trace of these ridges to have the ridges track directly under those cross faults. Um, and it's not. Today, today it's not. And so that means that those ridges are kind of going up, moving obliquely under the Himalaya. Um, that doesn't mean that they couldn't be causing cross faults. They could be, but it's a little different scenario. My favorite explanation, but this is just like based on nothing but gut feeling, but you know, we know in Tibet we've got east-west extension. We have these big grommet structures. And and wouldn't it make sense that that, that deformation continues to the south and affects the rocks um, in the Himalaya proper? Um, so we don't know the answer, but uh, interesting to speculate. But in Montana, where I live, we spent a lot of time shoveling snow, many months. So last winter, when I was pushing snow off my deck behind my house, um, I was creating thrust faults and thrust belts. But in every one of my thrust belts, I would get these cross faults that would break the snow up. And, uh, and so it's like, well, maybe, uh, maybe it's just a material property problem that you can't have a major thrust fault in the, in the strength of the rocks in our crust and have it be laterally continuous and have that convergence be at the same rate everywhere, so it ends up breaking up, but, but I don't know. Um, so just a couple of final thoughts to wrap up here. I, I think most importantly, international collaboration is important and necessary to do what we do, and I appreciate this award that's allowed me to come here and meet with you all because I think it helps uh, uh, promote this spirit of international collaboration. Uh, on the science front, I'd say, you know, I, I think these cross faults are important and mostly for the hazard, the, the, their impact on the natural hazards. And so we, there's a lot we need to do, a lot we still don't know about it. Uh, but I, I hope to continue somewhat myself, but when I look at all you younger faces out there, there's a lot of work for you to do in the Himalaya and elsewhere. So um, with that, I'll just say thank you for having me. I'm happy to take questions. I, I don't know the, the format uh, that you typically do here. Ask you any structural geology related question, <laughs> but um, I'm, what I'm want, I want to know. Uh, in my study, I, uh, I work in a, a steep cliff area for uh, sedimentological uh, interpretation, and uh, I face a huge problem for uh, logging. And in that case, uh, sedimentary logging. Yeah. So in that ca case, uh, I used the uh, drone, uh, UAV. So uh, oh, yeah. I found, yeah, I found uh, you face the same problem of steep slope. Uh, and uh, one of my colleagues, PhD colleague, uh, he was uh, working on the structure of the stuff, uh, and uh, he was using uh, uh, UAV technology and photogrammetry for the interpretation. Yeah. So uh, now we know uh, we have entered in the nanotechnology. Yeah. So uh, using the nanoscale observation, everything is uh, being changed. And uh, recently, uh, the uh, Himalayan studied like 
uh, just seen far away from uh, the outcrop. If we can collect uh, the closer image and create some photogrammetry and uh, the virtual uh, 3D model and interpret both sedimentological uh, from the, both from sedimentological aspect and uh, uh, structural geological aspect, uh, then I think uh, it may change the interpretation. But not for the large scale feature like you know fault or cross fault, but it may be uh, uh, we get some. Uh, inside uh, from the small scale so like lineation or small scale uh, joint. Yeah. So do you have any plan to go in detail by studying uh, using this approach? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, twice I've written a proposal to the uh, SEG, uh, they have a program called Geoscience Without Borders. And my proposal was to use a drone with LIDAR. So some of the good drones, big drones, can carry a LiDAR camera, and with that you can see through vegetation. And so my hope was to work with Nepali students um, to fly the drone and over some of the structures, kind of around Kathmandu, but where you could, if you could see through the vegetation, you might see where some of these linear features, you could see what's going on kind of at the rock scale. And in some cases, maybe even um, when it's close to a steep slope, see whether something is, uh, about to, you know, has the higher risk of landslide, like it's fracturing and, and, and could slip at any time. Um, the proposals weren't funded, and, and largely they weren't funded because of the cost of LIDAR. And I, I feel like I, um, I think those proposals will be worth resubmitting when the cost of LIDAR comes down, and it is coming down, and the uh, design of drones is getting better and better, so, so I think that there's a lot of potential there. But part of my hope was getting training the Nepali students to use the drone because when they get jobs working on hydro projects or road building or the other things that are going on that they're being employed with, to be able to use the drone to efficiently get uh, access to some of that outcrop that they couldn't otherwise, it could be really great. And with the drone, you could do things that you, I suppose you could do with a helicopter, but with, in a helicopter, it's great cost. A drone, you could go out in an afternoon, get it done, and it, could be, it could, should be, eventually will be affordable. Um, we may still you know, try and pursue that. I'll also say that just last week, I met with one of the students that was in the previous slide uh, from the uh, central campus of Trichandra, you know, or uh, Trikuban University, and he had been playing around with multi-spectral image. So it's, uh, again, it's back to larger scale of satellite imagery. But the Kulakani, where I took a little waterfall and said there was fault fabric behind the waterfall, he got this beautiful image with some combination of bands, I don't know which ones, uh, in the multispectral image of that fault coming right down from Kathmandu. Uh, and it's a zone and it's a bunch of unechelon segments. And, um, and so hopefully at some point we'll, we'll get, be able to get that published and or apply that method to some of the other places. So there is a lot, yes, that can happen with technology. And it's, it's hard for us old people. You know, you have to give us a break because we don't, you know, we can't use all that stuff as easily as some of you. But but no, it's, it's really great. So. Uh, any other questions? Anyone? So you see me for a card later. <laughs> Putting roads in, or if we do, there's a lot we can do from an engineering point of view 
Um, and I, I guess I don't have any problem with the ethics of um, preventing a landslide. Uh, the, the earthquake situation is way different for sure. And I, I don't think we have the technology to do anything in California where the San Andreas Fault is the big topic uh, from an earthquake point of view. It's been proposed, oh, what if we inject fluid and we have many small earthquakes? But the danger there is um, if you inject fluid and you create the big one, you know, you're going to re reduce some stress, you may kill a lot more people. So that's not, um, we, we don't have, we don't have the knowledge to do that sort of thing safely. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure I'm answering your question for sure, but, uh, you know, when I think about development in the Himalaya, I think about Switzerland. So who's been to Switzerland in this country? A few of you, I think. In the front row, a few of you. Um, the Swiss have, a quick, all right, the Swiss have money, so that's a, you know, what do we do about that? But they, they've really been able to engineer, the Japanese do some pretty amazing work as well, engineer um, good roads, good tunnels in tectonically active areas. And so I, I think a lot of that can be done. Um, and yeah, it's going to take a while for that to happen in Nepal, but um, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not in my lifetime. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, in connections with uh, Dr. Mustafa's questions, uh, something pop up in my mind. Uh, have you ever used uh, like some modern resolution, digital resolution model, which can give you some sort of uh, idea about the linear medicine force rather than using the LIDAR data because in Himalaya perhaps you might have a lot of major differences rather than the subtle elevation differences so in my sense uh, the freely available uh, digital resolution models from the UHGS could uh, have been a better solution to identify the linear medicine force the other way have you ever used like in your team uh, have had used um, some sort of image enhancement techniques to identify the linearness? Yeah, so that's, so I just mentioned the one that the student did with multispectral imaging. Um, yeah, other than that, you know, we, we looked at digital elevation. PSRP and yeah. The digital, digital elevation model. Yeah, um, and so... Yeah, it's a 30 meter, not a lighter one, because I, I personally think it's practically it's not possible to run a lighter survey over there. It's a bigger area, so... What you can do, you can go for an isolated exposure for the lighter survey, but uh, it's not convenient in terms of financial stuff. Uh, rather than doing this, you know, there's a lot of elevation differences. So DTM is the best choice, but it's uh, very scarce, this yes. DTM sort of thing. Yeah. Rather than DTM, we can use the DT, uh, DM, um, which is a surface elevation model, but at least we can get... So what's the TM? Explain. Uh, DTM is the digital terrain model without the surface features, like uh, the parent land, without any vegetation, any structure. Uh, but it's not available freely. Uh, you have to go for some sort of surveys. Uh, but instead of that, you yeah. can use DSM. And, that, and that's digital element. The, digital both the digital data. elevation model the difference is one is including the surface and there is no surface. Just think about the Himalayan regions, the lesser Himalayan regions without any vegetation, just the pattern. Just like the, right. the upper Himalayas. So it's obtained from satellite, uh, satellite digital elevation data. Uh, it's not satellite. It's, uh, it's, kind of, it's the byproduct of interferometry. It's a rather satellite. Yeah, yeah the byproduct. Is, it is, yeah. yeah. But it's a very uh, useful tool to identify the uh, digital elevation models to identify the okay. linear events. So I have a small work in Lesan Himalaya, so I have okay. I used this thing to yeah. identify the linear events. You don't have to show me. Uh, 30 meter. It's a 30 meter resolution. It's what? 30 meter resolution. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. No, but for the bigger area, you would have a good one. You can get a lot of good uh, outcomes from the data. The right, right. But light, light is not. So, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ashapur, 
Uh, Dr. Rasha, uh, this question about the uh, methodology. So, yeah, his approach is uh, okay for the large scale study, but uh, uh, for detailed investigation, if we use a larger drone, it's fine. Uh, because the, uh, the resolution of his data set, what he proposed, is 30 meter. So, most of the uh, linear, yeah, so uh, small scale spacers cannot be identified by, by that. So, we can, uh, we can use both sets of data. Uh, for detail, we, we may use uh, uh, larger, larger yeah, data set. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, is a good approach. Yeah, thank right. you. Yeah, thanks. That's not a debate. I'm not going for any debate. Yeah. Can, can you tell me what is the length of the across one of your cross ports? Ah, so yeah, the length. It's basically the it's the width of the range because they go from the like from north to south. Yeah. yeah, from north to south. So that's what several hundred kilometers. Yeah. So for for starting a several hundred kilometer linear features, yeah. line is not a good solution. That's why I'm asking. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah, so, so no, we, we yeah. don't need any uh, like higher resolution stuff. We need to identify the pores. To cross check for uh, the core, we can go for a small exposure. Yeah. There we can use the lighter technology. Yeah. That, might, that was my assumption. And, and for the large scale, even just from Google Earth, we can see these yeah. linear structures. So, so that's not a problem. And that's why we were turning to LIDAR to look. If we want to understand these in detail, we need to know you know, where exactly the faults are, because these are zones, so there's, there are unechelon segments um, or, or zones of deformation, so we want to understand the nature of them in the field, you know, hence the LIDAR part, yeah. but yeah, identifying them in a larger scale, yeah. um, even Google Earth is quite, you know, I, I think that we probably ultimately want multiple methods, we can do it a first, a first run with something like Google Earth. Yeah. That multispectral that the student was doing actually shows a lot more than the Google Earth imagery. Yeah. And maybe what you're talking about would be uh, an alternative even um, as well. But there was one question in the back too Thank we you. should get to. Yeah, thanks for that. Hello, ma'am. I am Sheikh Sajid Mahmoud. Uh, my question is about uh, the southeastern uh, lineament that you talked where the aftershocks ended abruptly. You showed a lineament where the aftershocks in the Himalayan oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 2015 earthquake in Nepal, the aftershocks ended abruptly on uh, yeah, and that showed a lineament. Yeah. So my question was, uh, for an abrupt uh, stop of aftershocks, there has to be a gap. Uh, the gap has to come from any sort of extensional force. Because uh, if it was a thrust fault, you say that it could be a fault, we didn't, you didn't study that, but it could, if, if it was a uh, thrust fault, there would be a connection and the fault would, uh, the aftershock would then continue towards or then continue the faulting more. And if it was only a normal fault, then the aftershocks could end. So that was my thought and I was uh, trying to ask you that what will you think about this theory, that that being a normal fault. Yeah, no, I think I think it is probably a normal fault, um, but it's, all these have a large lateral complement to them. Yes. Um, and the important thing in, is, is probably just that it's, I'm guessing it's some sort of a fault zone that's perhaps been mineralized, and the big thrust fault that caused the earthquakes, yes. its lateral propagation then was inhibited by that structure um, you know, that just didn't allow movement to go through it. In some ways, it doesn't matter if it's a normal fall or reverse fall or strike slip. It's it's a barrier to that propagation of the fracture. And actually, there's an interesting study that somebody did in uh, a recognized off, I think it was Chile, it's either Chile or Peru, but it was um, the Andean subduction zone. And there was a big earthquake there. Oh, I used to know that it was maybe 2011. Anyway, the, the rupture propagated and the, there were enough seismic stations to really map this, to watch this happen. The rupture propagated and on the northern side of it, it stopped, something stopped it. And it stopped for 30 seconds and then it broke through but with less energy. And, um, and they proposed that there was a cross fault structure there. It turns out that I want to say it's the Nazca Ridge is subducting at that location, and they thought that the Nazca Ridge had influenced the structure in the upper plate, or, or actually cutting all the way through, um, that somehow it was a barrier. 
So, you know, that's another piece of evidence that, that current structures could limit rupture or impact rupture propagation to some extent. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. We learned uh, many things from your presentation, slides, uh, photographs, and your experience. Uh, really, it, it's, it's a great learning for us as a faculty of the Department of Geology. Uh, my, uh, it's, it's, I just want to inform you, uh, based on your experience, you can tell us uh, something about that. That is, you, you know, um, uh, uh, Nepal has been experiencing uh, earthquakes. Even yesterday, they experienced an earthquake. Oh, another one. Yeah, yeah. another one. So uh, recently, uh, um, a couple of earthquakes, um, three, four, uh, uh, like this, and you will be there. I hope you will be safe there. Finally, you will be there. There will be no earthquake. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> so my simple, uh, uh, I want to learn from you that actually, uh, uh, that is the Nepal segment of the Himalayan. So uh, it's happening there. And uh, what, what, what are the, uh, actually, what uh, are the causes? Actually, uh, uh, and what about the Assam segment? Yeah. Uh, actually, Assam segment is very close uh, to uh, Bengal Basin. Yeah, yeah. We are uh, also concerned about, uh, as you know, yeah. all uh, tectonic elements lies around the Bengal Basin. So, uh, uh, what are the causes? What are the possible causes uh, of the earthquake in uh, uh, Nepal, which has been uh, happening recently yeah. and uh, your uh, uh, views about the Assam segment. Yeah. So would you please uh, tell us a thing uh, mm -hmm. for us, for our students. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So, so the recent earthquakes have been in western Nepal and that's been a gap. So you know, we know that India continues to converge. Um, I don't know exactly the rate of that convergence, but it's continuing to converge. So, so somehow that stress or that displacement, that movement has to be accommodated. And um, and typically what happens is you get the stick slip behavior, you know, that generates an earthquake. Um, but we, when we have an earthquake and it releases that stress, it accommodates some of that movement and some of that convergence. But when you have a quiet zone that hasn't had any earthquakes, um, and our geodesy can now also tell us if it's accommodating the convergence or if it's we're not getting that movement, which means the stress is building up. And Western Nepal has been recognized as one of these gaps um, for some time, so they kind of expect a big one. Um, I, I think people were thinking that a big one wouldn't come, you know, soon, just because we've, we've just had the big quakes, on, you know, in central, central Nepal. Um, I like small quakes because they tend to, you know, slowly release some of that stress. In terms of Assam, uh, I don't actually know its earthquake history and where it fits into the gap thing, but that's certainly a complicated area because you're, you're beginning, the range begins to terminate or as it transitions around the syntaxis there, so the structures are quite complex. Um, you know, the, the Shilong Plateau growing out to the south, in some ways that might actually be helpful because you might be taking that convergence and splitting it between the Himalayan mountain front and the Shilong Plateau. It doesn't mean you're not going to have earthquakes, though, um, but, you know, they may happen in different places. And actually, a big quake in the Shilong would be probably worse for you than, than in Assam. So um, I, I, I can't answer that question exactly. And I don't know if anybody can. I, though somebody could probably give you better information about, you know, where it fits in terms of a gap. And there have not been big quakes there for a while, and um, you know, what did we do? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I'm a student actually of geology, yeah. not expert in structural geology, but anyway, I have some, I have a few questions, all understanding. So what I understand from your presentation that Due to the convergence of Indian plate and Eurasian plate, there's an obvious thing is thrusting yeah. over thrusting. And the cross poles is the secondary uh, trace distribution effects. Yeah. So what I understand, since there is a acute or curvature yeah. 
in the thrust stream. So there is a trace distribution in the trans tensional in the southern part and trans pressional in the northern part. If we understand. Oh, oh yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah. Could be, yeah. yeah. So for this region you have some normal type of faulting in the southern cross ports. Yeah. Could it be the uh, trusting behavior in the northern part? Right. That, that would make sense. Yeah. Except that, again, what we see, you know, we know in Tibet coming down, we have all that extension. Yes. So I'm not aware of uh, significant convergence that's sort of range, range, uh, you know, orthogonal convergence along the range, like you're saying. Because, you, you know, you're saying if it's radial, it's, it's, like it's going to open up right. in the front and it's going to come together in the back. Um, but we don't, yeah, we don't see it like that. There's not a lot of strong evidence. And again, because once you get up here in the back, you've got Tibet pulling apart like that. So, yeah. Okay, so you, you also mentioned that some uh, very fine or thinly laminated centimeter rock there. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. in most of the places, we will, what we understand that uh, metamorphic type of rocks. Yeah. So do you have any idea of uh, which age range could be the centimeter? It's very recent. Yeah, so the, the, the ages that we got on those lake sediments okay. is, uh, was 13,000 to 40,000 years. Oh, only okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my mistake. So, yeah, so that's that's, that's, sorry. yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. okay. Um, but okay. yeah, I still don't understand why they are where they are. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I would appreciate my students. They should have some lot of questions, <laughs> not for us. <laughs> if they don't ask, then we will ask them. Uh -oh. <laughs> if they really understand or not. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Anybody? Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. So, okay, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for the lecture session. Thank you very much everyone for being patient for the lecture session. I hope we had an amazing journey together with Dr. Hubbard. video seems helpful to you please like and subscribe Earth Detective and also visit our YouTube channel where we uploaded a lot of videos based on Earth science. We also organize the videos in playlists based on topics. Feel free to explore and suggest us what you want to learn from us. You can also check description for links of our social media, website for resources, PowerPoint file and further discussion. Thanks for watching.